All right. Hi. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Marguerite Ashton, for Crime Writers Panel and Criminal Lines. On our panel today, we have, as you can see, we have my mentor, Jim Alt. He's a friend of the show. <laughs> and our special guest today is Bill Cannon. He is a, um, a um, professor at Monroe College, and he teaches um, criminal justice. He's also a retired detective sergeant, and he is here to talk to us about his life in law enforcement. So I'm really looking forward to him sharing his stories and um, letting us know what it's like in law enforcement. So thank you for joining us here, Bill. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Marguerite, I'm happy to be here. Should I start this with Once Upon a Time? or? <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> be a little more original than that. Well, yeah. when did you when did you know you really wanted to go get into the police force? Okay, you know, right I actually in high school. No, I, I actually started later than most people. I went to college, and I was a broadcast journalism major in college. And when I got out of college, I didn't wind up getting into that field. And I, to make money, I started working as a bartender. And I wound up because I was making so much money as a bartender, not wanting to take what was considered an entry level job back then because I really couldn't afford to do it, you know. And I, I was making real money as a bartender and oh, sure. to me to take what was considered a real job, I would have made probably uh, half of what I was making as a bartender, even less than that. So I wound up getting sort of stuck in Tendon Bar for about five years. And during that time I took the police test. And I sort of just took it because I, I didn't really intend on taking the job, but just sort of as a lark. And then when it came up, I really wanted to do it. I really wanted to go on the police department. So I didn't go on until I was like 28 years old, Okay. which was later. So you, yeah, but when you got in, you were inspired to go and really do it. Yeah, I think it probably helped me that, A, I had a college education. B, I was more mature than back then. You could go on the police department when you were 20 years old, which to me, that's a very young age to go on the police department. You know, you're, telling, you're responding to family disputes and telling 60 year olds how they should uh, deal with their marriage. And you're right. 20 and you've, you, know, you haven't even had many relationships. Never mind telling a couple right. how they should uh, conduct their marriage. You know? Right. So it was a little bit intimidating to be that age. But I, was, I came home when I was 28, I was very confident and I felt that I was more mature than most of the people that I went through the academy with. But you were saying earlier about that 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 event a month before you actually got on the force. There was a, a very a very strong event. That, that yeah, I, you know, I lived in Stuyvesant Town, which is uh, off of First Avenue. Uh, I lived on uh, 14th Street off of Avenue A, and back then that wasn't a very nice area. And my roommate's girlfriend and his two kids from a prior marriage were followed home by a a, a robber who accosted them on the elevator and pulled a gun on them and stuck them up on the elevator. And she had offered to give him $500 and a gold chain on the elevator. He wasn't interested in that. He wanted to go into the apartment, which we could uh, surmise very bad things were about to happen. But when the elevator got to the 12th floor, I was waiting there with my brother. We both tended bar at a bar, a lo local bar, and we knew something was very wrong inside the elevator. We saw this guy with my roommate's girlfriend, his two kids that were at the time four and six years old, and she was looked you know, on her face like she was terrified. So she had told us, um, she was trying to mouth to us that this guy had a gun, and she asked us if we'd open the door of the apartment. So I did, and uh, he came in the apartment, dropped the bag, and pulled the gun on us and announced the sticker. Now, you know, people, TV people act like, you know, when someone pulls a gun on you, go ahead, what are you going to do with that? That's not how you act when someone sticks a gun in your face. You're like, yes, what can I do for you? You know. And uh, I tried to assure the guy that you know, if he's going to rob us, give him whatever he wanted as long as he didn't hurt anybody. But then he started showing us his intention was to tie us up, which I wanted no part of that. Everything that uh, happens after you get tied up is bad. So I took an opportunity and I hit the guy and... Uh, at the same time going for the gun and he fired four shots at me and my brother who knocked both of us down into the vestibule and uh, as luck would have it, unluck I guess my brother took a bullet in the stomach 
and we disarmed him and held him to the police. So that was a, a month before I went on the police department. And incidentally, that guy was out on parole for murder, which wasn't that unusual back then because there was all kinds of parolees looking around the city looking to do their next crime. And he, he, so he, and the week before that incident, he had stuck someone else up. So he did a long time in prison, and every year that he came up for parole, I called the parole board and I kept him in. The year he finally got out because he maxed out on his sentence, I called ICE, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. They were at the prison and they met him as he walked out and they deported him back to the Dominican Republic. And then the ICE, the ICE officer called me a couple months after and said, you're going to love it. He went to the Dominican Republic and got arrested. He's in prison in the Dominican Republic. I said, I love it. I guess I'll, hopefully I'll never see him again. <laughs> and that was a month before I went on the police department. Oh, very wow. good. <laughs> wow. You um when you when you went in and you said this is it, this is what I'm doing. Were you comfortable? Did it take a while to even get adjusted to this decision or because of the event that happened prior to you knew that this is what you wanted? What happened? Yeah, I, I mean I, I think that sort of uh got me to the point where like, wow, there's really some bad people in this world. And, you know, I'd like to be on the other side and, and try to help people against people like this guy that didn't hesitate to shoot somebody after trying to take their money. So, yeah, I was pretty motivated to, to uh, now, and I knew what I wanted to do, and I was uh, excited about, you know, being on the police department. And then I went through the police academy, which only was about six blocks. I could walk to work for the six months I was in the police academy. You know, and in the police academy, you meet all kinds of people from all over the city. And, you know, they would call the kids from Long Island East Cupcake, kids that lived north of the city in Rockland and uh, Westchester. That was North Cupcake. And then the people that lived in the five boroughs, you know, they were the city people. They were the tough guys, you know. And uh, it was just sort of funny. That was the culture in the police academy. But you met people from all over the city. And that was sort of interesting. The only kind of population you can meet people like that usually is in the, uh, the service, the army, the navy, something like that, where you meet people from all over the place. And it was sort of interesting in that way. And I, I didn't love the academy because I thought it was like um, a little bit infantile in a lot of ways. That it was sort of a military type training where they taught you uh, law, police science, and, and social science. And of course, firearms training and driver training and how to interact with the public. And sort of, if you had been around the block a few times, you sort of saw that most of the instructors at the police academy had about two years on the street. So half of them didn't even have any war stories to tell. If they were telling you a war story, they were borrowing someone else's because they didn't have any. You know? <laughs> and they wanted to get assigned yeah. to the police academy because it was a safe place to work. And back then, the streets was pretty dangerous. So the police academy people weren't, I would say, respected as street cops. You know? So And even the rookie cops could sort of see that. Okay. Well... <laughs> Bill, I'm listening, and I just I love listening to your stories. These are they're so it's so real, it's so different, and it's the the reality it can is shocking, it's scary, and this is what you have gone through. You and I talked before during our interview on um, PTSD uh, with law among law enforcement. So here you are, you're in, and you started out on patrol, is that correct? Yeah, you know, when, when you got out of the police academy, back in like 1985, the police department was very, very protective of new officers coming out on the street. And you would go into training uh, for six months and you had what was called FTOs, which stood for field training officers. And they were detectives that had a lot of years on the job. And they would call them, back then, the, the expression hairbag. Everyone on the job, oh, that guy's a hairbag. What does that mean? And I kept wondering, where did that derivation of that term hairbag come from? And I asked a few people, and one, the best answer I got was, well, all-time cops, they, they, when they got their, Christmas, you know, their money for uniforms, they always got it right before Christmas. They would never spend it on uniforms. They would spend it on Christmas for their kids. Uh -huh. So their uniforms got so old that it looked like hair was growing from them. So they would call them, that's where the term hairbag came from. And it became to mean, mean an old-time cop. Well, look at that hairbag, you know. And it was sort of a funny expression because 
you might even have a cop with three years on a job, and they go, oh, that guy thinks he's a hairbag, you know. And everyone knew what you were talking about. It's sort of like police jargon. You don't hear that as much anymore. But anyway, so the police department was very protective of new cops coming on the street. And when you came out of the academy, they put you in a scooter job. And you would work a week of days, eight to fours, and a week of four to twelves. And on one end, you would have two days off, and the next week, you would have three days off. Now, the new uh, cops coming out of the academy, they put them in this unit called Impact. You give them like Tuesdays and Wednesdays off. They're working six at night to two in the morning, or eight at night to four in the morning. And they put them in the highest crime precincts, and they try to get activity out of them. Out of them. It, it's totally different than what my experience was. Because back then it was viewed that the streets were much more dangerous than they are now. Not to say they're not dangerous now. They were much more dangerous. And the old-time cops really did look out for us and protected us, almost like we were their little brothers, you know. But it was always like, hey, kid, don't touch the radio, you know, that type of thing. Uh, you'd hear that, or you'd, you'd walk by some old-time cops talking, and as you walk by, they would shut up and they would talk. Because <laughs> it was viewed that they couldn't trust you because you were new. I don't know if that same culture exists now, but I appreciated that the fact that we were new and we were looked out for, not just by the other cops, but by the bosses, mm -hmm. the captains, the lieutenants, the sergeants. Thus, when we first became cops and a precinct, a sergeant was, oh my God, what a high-ranking guy, a sergeant, you know, it's one level, but we looked at sergeants with, in awe, basically. And now I don't know if the same is true either. But it was, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole culture, the police department. So you would go for training for six months, and hopefully in training you'd make your first robbery arrest or you'd make your first big arrest so you could go to your precinct with one medal above your shield instead of nothing uh, above your shield. You'd be like, oh, look at this guy, right? <laughs> and then you'd go to your permanent precinct, and then that's where you would be assigned till either you left there, you got promoted, you moved on or something. So I went from NSU 4 and I got assigned to the 2-0 precinct uh -huh. on the Upper West Side, which was known as a hook house, meaning that you knew somebody to get there because it was a very nice place to work. Mm -hmm. You know, it was back then it wasn't as nice as, as it is today, but it still was the Upper West Side. You know, Museum of Natural History, Central Park West, the richest people in the world live on Central Park West that, that don't want to live on the East Side, right? And... Lincoln Center, uh, so a lot of cultural things. But back then, even the 2 old precinct had a lot of crime. And it, it, sometimes, I remember back then, the 2 old precinct might get 70, 80 robberies a month. Now even the busiest precincts in the city don't get 70 or 80 robberies a month. Uh, it's just the whole nature of how crime has changed. So I worked in the uh, 2 old precinct and, uh, when I was first assigned there. And my goal was always, I, I wanted to get into plain clothes. I so was enamored with anti-crime work. And I was like, oh, look at that. These guys get to wear plain clothes to work. Back then, you could grow a beard. With like a year and a half, two years on the job, I had a full beard. People looked at me like, how much time you got on the job? And I had a full beard. It was sort of like a badge of honor. <laughs> now they don't let cops grow a beard anymore, unless they're in narcotics, if they're on uh -huh. the call. Back then, you were an anti-crime. You could grow a beard. And they would, it was known something like as the anti-crime uniform. Cops would wear green army jackets, blue dungarees, uh, a dark shirt, and uh, a New York Yankee cap. That was like the plain clothes uniform, right? Mm -hmm. And every boss would be like, all right, stop wearing the anti-crime uniform, right? Can't you get anything? The, the bad guys know now. You guys wear green army jackets, blue dungarees, and a New York Yankee cap. Let's change up a little bit, right? <laughs> but to me, it was the most exciting thing because your work – and anti-crime was self-initiated. You would have a boss, which was a sergeant, and then you'd have like four to five cops in two unmarked cars, and you would patrol on your own, and you might call the other unit and say, hey, we got two guys in and out of the side streets, iron people, come over to this location. And the other call would be, where do you want us to set up? Set a parallel them on, the, on um, Amsterdam Avenue, and we'll direct you where we want you. And then we would have one guy out on foot, close, and we'd be on point-to-point -point radios. And lots of times we'd catch them right in the act. They'd do a robbery right in front of us, and then they'd be so shocked they got caught, you know, 20 feet from where they did the robbery. You know, they thought they were slick, too. You know, it's sort of they were, we were on them, but, you know, they thought they were so slick 
the, the way they were behaving in and out of side streets, following people. And after a while, you got a great eye. You could spot somebody, you know, the way someone moved on the street, the way someone watched somebody. When someone passed someone, they turned around and, and looked at them. Someone could be walking north, and they, they looked at someone that went west into the side street. Yeah. They turned around and followed the person in the side street. That's what would raise your antenna, that this person's up to something. Well, that's and look, you didn't have to intrude upon them until they did something because someone was on them. They would get surveillance immediately. And then that's how we made most of our arrest, observation robbers. So then even then, I mean, just it's, it's almost, it is second nature for you, correct? It's just there. You know. Well, you know, so I think I had a certain amount of innate ability to be good at it because I may, I, with a year and five months on, I made an, uh, uh, an armed robbery of a bank arrest, and the, the perpetrator sold off M1. And basically, I made that observation. I, I was playing clothes. I wasn't even working. I was off duty. And I ran up, I saw a bunch of people running out of the bank. I asked them what happened. I said, oh, a guy just stuck up the bank. And I said, which way did he go? And they pointed where he went. So I ran up the street, and this woman goes, he ran inside that building. I go, oh, cool. And I pulled my little five shot off my ankle, and this guy had an M130 carbine, you oh. know? I think about it, I say, well, maybe that wasn't that smart, but, you know, I guess, uh, anyway, I, I sort of got the jump on him. He was changing his clothing by a freight elevator, and I got him to come out with his hands up and all that stuff, and I put him on the wall, and as I had him on the wall, I got into what's called a confrontation situation with another cop, because I was in plain clothes, and he was in uniform, and he, I, I have the guy on the wall, my gun out, and he yells at me, drop your gun. And I look at him like, drop my gun. I'm the police. And he goes, drop it. And I go, oh, no, I'm not dropping my gun. And we're trained to how to deal with a, a, a confrontation situation. I said, I won't turn around. I go, my shield's in my left rear pocket. I'm going to reach in. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to throw it back to you. I go, but I'm not dropping my gun. Because I was more afraid of the bad guy. If I drop my gun, he's going to grab my gun and shoot me than right. I was of the cop shooting me. So I took my chances with the cop. And then shortly thereafter, cops from my precinct showed up on the scene, and they said, oh, that's Cannon. And they go, he's a cop. And then they looked, and they ran in. We cuffed the guy up, and we went into the freight elevator, and he had a sold-off 30 carbine and all the money from the, the bank robbery. And the next week, I, I was put into the that crime, and I was still on probation. I had a year and five months on the job. Incidentally, my commanding officer at that time was, uh, his name was Captain Louis Anamone, who later became the chief of the department. Many years later. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Do you have anything? <laughs> That's cool. Sort of an interesting story. I mean, when yeah, I tell it, yeah. Uh, well, you know, when you're doing this kind of thing, uh, I wondered. Okay, there's a little thing that I heard about that made sense to me at the time. And I used to live in Las Vegas, where they have casinos and everything security with you know, people watching you, watching the employees, surveillance cameras, and what they like to hire for security, and it seems to make sense, taller people so they can see better when things are going on. They can scan the crowd. They can notice things that you can't see if you're only five foot five. Is that true when you're out there on the beat? Well, you know, some spotting, like when people ask you, especially when you're in plain clothes, well, how did you spot it on the street? Or they'll say, oh, I saw the guy, I saw the guy do a purse snatcher, I saw the guy do a robbery, or I saw the guy do a pickpocket. Well, that's easy. I go, oh, really? Go out on the street and go find me a pickpocket right now. Right? It's not easy. It's very subtle. But there's certain things that can put you on to a perpetrator that's doing that. I used to love working pickpockets, and we used to do it in Times Square when I was in the citywide anti-crime. We would work the theater district, and pickpockets work the theaters. Sure. Because people go to the theater have money, right? And pickpockets love to pick when the light changes because a whole crowd goes across the street yep. at the same time. Pickpockets love to pick in the stairwells of buses. What do women do in the stairwell of a bus? They open up their pocketbook, right? Yep. And they're not looking in their pocketbook. They're looking at the, at the bus driver. So as they open their pocketbook, the, po the pickpocket is going in and helping himself to the wallet. So all these subtle things. People that carry um, cleaners bags, you know, with the with the uh, plastic on them. I've seen pickpockets drape that over someone's bag and pretend that it's caught on it. That's the distraction. With every pickpocket, there was what's called a bump or a stall, and then right. a pick. 
And, you know, at, when you work plain clothes, you get to see this so many times. And the behavior of pickpockets, you can spot it right away. Also, their walk. When they're walking in the crowd, they have an unnatural gait because they have to walk the speed of the person in front of them. So they're, instead of you walking, your stride may be a certain length. Now it's short, so they're doing sort of like a stutter step. And right. normal, most people don't see that, but when you're an anti-crime cop and you do it every day, you notice what people are doing and you notice how they move. Yeah. And I, mine, I became very good at that. Yeah, a friend of mine said, when you can tell in the casino when people, if you just watch their eye movement, an average person lets their eyes sort of wander around. They're not focused on any one thing for more than a few seconds. They're usually looking for something in general rather than studying the person right next to them or in front of them or looking down and never moving their eyes side to side because they're trying to focus. Exactly. You see, you see someone focusing when they really shouldn't be, that's the clue that he follows. Well, that's why card players wear sunglasses. Yeah. Right? Because they don't want people to see their eyes. Well, and sometimes pickpockets do the same thing. Yeah. Because your eyes betray you. Yeah. You know? If you can, you know, you, you sometimes you'll see a man when he knows he's going to get emotional, all of a sudden he's wearing sunglasses. He doesn't want anyone to see him cry, right? Right. Tears running down his face. Oh, why are you wearing sunglasses? It's 9 o'clock at night. Oh, you know, it's, it's a little dark, you know. Yeah, but that, that's the reason. He doesn't want to see, because again, your eyes betray you. Your right. eyes betray, later on, you know, your eyes betray you in an in interrogation, body language. You know, your eyes always betray you. So that's something you learn how to look at and how to use uh, in anti-crime and, and plain clothes. And that, you know, those type of behaviors, you really have to be what's called a trained observer. And not, not all uniform cops have that gift or have the, the inclination to learn that. Because it takes, for most people, it takes years to do that. And it takes a lot of patience, too. It's easier sometimes to just listen to the radio and say, oh, assault uh, on 125th Street and Broadway, uh, the crowd's holding one. You know, now everyone that wants the arrest is racing to that, to that scene because they <laughs> want to make the arrest so they can make overtime, you know. <laughs> and that's not so hard to do. But, you know, uniform cops, that's their sector, depending on what sector is. That's, that's their arrest. That's how, how the rules go. But if that yeah. sector doesn't want the arrest, then everyone that shows up, the buzzards that show up that are looking for overtime, yeah. right? right. They, the sector can give the arrest away. Yeah. So that's another well, interesting I, thing I about police culture. Say, <laughs> being the only female on this panel, wow, Bill and Jim, you guys have made, yeah, I've been thinking. And it's, it's scary because... I'm listening to some of the, and I think that I'm already an observant person. I try to be careful if I have to go out at night. So this is just, it's like opening my eyes to different things that maybe I'm not so observant. That's kind of scary. So this is, no matter even how things change in life, no matter how things, but even with security cameras, um, being in parking lots, it's just, still I guess that person is brave or bold enough to do something it's going to happen. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? No, I know exactly what you say. You know, I always yeah. hoped that no matter how many years separate myself from being a cop, that I never lose the edge right. that I got from being a cop. And that sixth sense that you always have, like, don't get lulled into, oh, this world is so nice. Everyone's yeah. nice. No, everyone's not nice, you right. know. And you learn that as a cop, and you learn there's bad people out there. And John Q. Citizen sometimes lives in their own world, and they deny that this element is out there. You know, look, a lot of crime is moved to the internet. You know, yeah. people are people are identities being stolen, things being stolen over the internet, Craigslist. There's crimes everywhere. Like now, it's a new world we live in. Right, mm -hmm. it's moved from the street to cyberspace. You know, so uh, everything changes. You know? Yeah, my friend, my friend was saying how in relation to just what you talked about, Marguerite, that when you finally see somebody and they get caught, yeah. generally they've gotten away with it so many times, they just have gone to the point where either they let their guard down, they get careless, right. or they do it at the wrong place the wrong time. But if, you know, they said, yeah, but you didn't catch me the other 42 times I did this exact same thing, so they thought they were just going to always get away with it. No, yeah. absolutely. I would say most criminals get away with it probably 
10 to 15 times for every time they get caught. Mm -hmm. So just think, you know, it's like a shark swimming around fishing or eating 24-7, right? Mm -hmm. And right. one time maybe he, he picks on the wrong uh, person to eat and, right. and that, you know, he gets caught, you know? Right. And I, that's how I would always compare uh, a lot of the people that were involved in crime patrolling the streets and looking for a victim, you know? And it's right. sort of the same type of thing. And I think my uh, perception of how things were changed after I worked down at the police station. And, Bill, like you said, they'll do this for so many times before they're caught. Well, when I would do intake, it was... I was floored at some of the I don't care attitude that you know they gave me and one of the one of the guys he was the police officer down um <coughs> in the holding area and he said Margaret you have to you have to show that you're strong don't show any form of timidness or anything because they prey on that and I learned that um, the hard way after my, um, probably it took like three times um, doing the intake. And it's, I did, he was, he was right, I never did it again. But even after that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this world, it's, it's crazy. You have people that do not care what happens. And so now and then, as I said, and I went back to what we were just talking about, even then I guess I'm still just not up to date. This stuff just is still there no matter what, no matter how. Um, protected you think you are. Yeah, well, well, I have, get a, sort I have of a question. Uh, if I can yeah. interrupt for a moment, I have a question for Marguerite. Do you think as a crime writer that works in your favor that you have a like a a better image of people because you hope everybody's better or are you able to write from your perspective a better story than if you were someone like Bill who said I've seen the hard part of life. I think I'm a, I would have to say that I have, it does, it has allowed me, when I worked at the jail, it allowed me to open my eyes and see. And my husband, he says, you're making me nuts. Not everybody we see, there could be something wrong. And I said, well, honey, it's not that. It's just be aware because my husband, sometimes he just wasn't aware. And learning these things, learning what, the officer told me, and I took that to heart, and I still remember everything that he said. It it transformed me mentally because before then I was like, well, yes, there's bad guys, but then there's good guys too, and I try to stay positive and everything. But you also still have to be on alert. And so when I'm writing, even with everything I've learned, I have never been in Bill's shoes, but I'm able to see things a little differently now, and. Um, not as much as I'd like to, but I think when I listen to Bill, when I listen to all the LEOs that I talk with, it's just a, it's still something different. It's a different story, and they see things that we don't and we cannot capture unless we're in their shoes. No, that's uh, you know absolutely true. A lot of what you said, the person that told you, don't show weakness, and you hear a lot of correction officers say that because they're inside uh, with the bad guys. And they also say, don't let them learn anything about you, right. anything yep. personal about you, because yep. they'll use it against you. And correction officers have to live their life like that. Yeah. And you talk about post-traumatic stress, I would imagine yeah. correction officers have a great deal of that too, you know, mm -hmm. from dealing with people and being inside. It's almost like I think they say you do 20 years as a correction officer, you've done about eight, eight and a half years. Right. You know? Well, my... My friend, she's, um, I have a friend, she's in, uh, she's a corrections officer, and she said, and she's, she's a mom, and she said the only thing that she knows now is when her son is, hold on, I don't know those people yet type of thing, and let mom see what's going on before you can hang out with these people, and she said it's so frustrating because she'd come home that she just even has to deal with that, the irritation um, of trying to adjust and be strong, as a female, be strong, and then, you know, trying to make sure that your family's okay because you still see those those things, and so it puts stress on uh, the family and her. Yeah, well, it's hard not to bring that home with you. you know, mm -hmm. There's a job, I would think, that's very difficult not to bring that 
that part of your life home right. from the language that you're hearing inside. Yeah. I mean, I even sometimes even in my classes speak, speak street link language to the kids and they love it that I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, they laugh when I use certain street slang. How do you know that? You know, I told you I did 27 years in the NYPD. <laughs> All, you know, most of it, you know, you know in the whole of like, you know, I know how to speak street, right? Right. And they laugh when I use like, you know, like a Lucy. What is a Lucy? No one knows what a Lucy is unless you worked in the hood. In the hood, they sell loose cigarettes in a bodega. That's right. a Lucy. And I, that, just that I know that, they think that's funny, you know? Right. And uh, a 40. What's a 40? You know, no, no no, one in Westchester knows what a 40 is. Mm -hmm. A 40 is a 40 ounce beer, you know? But in the hood, they know what that is, you know? Or I'll tell them, I've never seen this before anywhere, but I, in the hood. And that's when someone walks down the street with a styrofoam plate eating Chinese food while they're walking. I've never seen that anywhere else in the world. Why do people do that? They laugh because they know it's true, right? <laughs> or even calling what we call a, right. a bodega a deli, a delicatessen, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I call it a bodega now. Sure, cause, you know, sure. That's what and it is to me. It's also interesting when you talk about authors, and they're trying to develop characters, but yet they haven't understood the lingo that you just talked about. Let alone why those people do what they do. Why do they walk down the street with that styrofoam plate and the Chinese food? Where does that come from? Right. Why would they be motivated to do something else if that's who the person is? And so a crime writer has got to go, how do I get inside the head of somebody coming from that area of town? Right, exactly. And unless you've experienced it and been around there. I, I had a detective that worked for me in a 2-3 squad and when he interviewed someone he never asked them, where do you live? He would ask them, where do you stay at? Because a lot of times in the hood, people stay at 10 different places. You know, they may, lay there, they may not have a legal address, right. but they have more places to stay than I have. You know, yeah. and uh, So he would always ask them, where are you staying? Well, sometimes I stay over here and give an ask. Sometimes I stay over there. Who's over there? Oh, that's my baby's mama. Who? And why do you stay over here? I got a shorty. There's another expression. In the hood, what's a shorty? And all my kids in school know what it is, and they start laughing. That's someone you're just having a one night stand with. It's just known that that's right. you know someone I have sex with. That's my yeah. shorty, you know. Right. And they, so you have to understand this language, because especially in the interview process, if they use certain language, you have to understand it. And that's how a lot of cops learn the language language that they speak with when they interview people. Right. And you know, it's a whole language of the street. Which is interesting in itself. But if you go overboard with it, they'll yeah. also look at you like, what are you kidding me? You're not from the hood. What are you talking about? You know? right. You're just showing off. Right? Right. You're just showing yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can imagine the rookie cop on the beat who's helping <laughs> like, interview the witnesses, the neighbors or something, may not even know what he's hearing. Right. That's, that's true. You know, It takes you a while to learn the ways of the street, what people are talking about. You know... Uh, and yeah, it does take a little while. Even learning all of police jargon takes a while when you're new to it. You know, oh, that's my RDO. Oh, he's the CEO. Oh, we're going to the PC's office. I mean, cops have an acronym for everything. You know, right. and when people from the outside world hear cops talk, they go, "What the hell did they just say?" Right? Because there's so many, so much slang and so many acronyms that the outside world doesn't necessarily understand what you're talking about. Right? But uh, that's what makes it interesting too, I guess. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's why, you know, you don't see that on TV because it's a little too hard. The, you, people, the audience wouldn't get the point. If the, Although, you know, if the screenwriter you know, did that, they might lose the audience because they go, oh, we don't know what he said. They might, but you know who? what one show that caught the language of the street, and I was sort of shocked and totally enthralled by it, and that was The Wire. The hmm. Wire, they, those writers hit it right on the head. They caught the language of the street. They caught the actions of the street. And I was, that's probably my favorite police show of all time. So if they, they watched, if a, if a crime writer watched that, they would really learn something about what they could put into their book that would be more Absolutely. Authentic. Absolutely. Okay. And, well, you know, it's also unique to Baltimore. Baltimore street lingo is a little bit different than New York. Every place has right. its own. And street language, of course, changes all the time. Yeah. You know, I try to get to my kids at school and ask them, what, what's the newest thing? Because <laughs> I'm yeah. not, not out of the street anymore. You got any new ones? <laughs> <laughs> Anything new I should right. know? 
Right. <laughs> right. You get the one person in the back going, "Is that word going to be on the test?" Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they say, "Professor Cannon, you're you're funny, but you're a little bit corny." I say, "Oh, okay, yeah. I'll take that as funny." <laughs> right. <laughs> Good. Well, so Bill, now um, we got you. You're you're in. You're um, moving on up. What was the next step for you that you figured you wanted to take? Um, with regards to your career in law enforcement, what where did you? Oh, you know, I made sergeant very early on on in my career. I actually only had four years and ten months. I got promoted to sergeant. And had I been younger, like had I come on the police department when I was twenty, I would have been very intimidated by that. I say so. If I would have came on when I was twenty, I would have been like twenty four, almost twenty five years old. But I was like thirty two years old by the time I got promoted. So I felt. I was very cocky, and I, when I look back on it, and I was just like, I'm ready to be a boss. You know, people are like, are you going to be able to tell a guy with 25 years on that's 50 years old what to do? I go, no problem, you know. <laughs> it's because of my, it was because I was older, you know, and I was ready to go. And I was in citywide anti-crime the year before I went there, so I thought I knew everything. And I was like, ah, oh, I was in citywide anti-crime. I'm almost a hairbag now, right? Yeah. But I didn't know everything. And I found that out. You know, I went. Once you make boss, you go back into uniform, back on patrol. Mm -hmm. So for six months, I went to the two six precinct, which is near Columbia University. And now, you know, you're not even you. When people call you sergeant, you start looking around, go, who they call who? And you start calling other sergeants sarge because mm -hmm. you're so programmed. And you know, you're a sergeant guy. You don't have to call me sarge. Call me Tom. Oh, oh okay, so you know, so you're so programmed to call him uh, sergeant. So I, I was ready to be a boss, but then I was back in uniform, and I see it's now you're responsible for people. Right. Now all the things maybe you tried to skate with and get away with, now you've got to stop people from doing that. You have to supervise people. You have to make sure they do everything right or do it the way they're supposed to do it. You have to worry about corruption. You have to worry about people taking too long on their meal, people showing up late for work, people responding to their job and, and not doing a proper investigation. All these things, all of a sudden, you're like, wow, this is what it's like being a boss. I liked it better being a cop. I didn't have to worry about anybody but me, right? Just I had to worry about my own actions. But when you learn how to be a boss, now you're responsible for everyone. And bosses above you say, what's going on with this guy? What's going on with that guy? I used to have this commanding officer in a 2-4 precinct when I first got assigned there. He would come up to me and go, did you see so-and-so's shoes? And I'd look at him, what are you talking about? And he was referring to the, the lack of a shine on the guy's shoes. I go, no, I didn't. He goes, aren't you a boss? I said, yes, Captain, I am. Well, go look at his And I was like, oh, my God, is this what I signed up for? <laughs> Worrying about whether a guy shined his shoes or not? And this was the way that this commanding officer kept everyone in line. He would dwell on their uniforms. Tuck your shirt in. Oh, cops are famous for wearing white socks, right? They're supposed to wear black socks. And no one sees it unless you're sitting down and then your pants roll up. And, oh, my God, look at that guy's wearing white socks. It's ridiculous, right? So all of those things now you have to be concerned with because now you're a boss. Now you're responsible for people. So anyway, I made boss, and then I, I went to the 2-4 precinct, which was also the Upper West Side, but it was higher uptown. It started at 96th Street. It went to 110th Street. That had a big, at that time, a big drug problem, a big crack trade, crack and hit. They actually had a lot of murders in the 2-4 when I first started. They were getting like anywhere from 24 to 30 murders a year. And it was all drug related. So that was a little different for me because I had come from a precinct that had a lot of robberies but didn't have much violence. So there was much more violence. And we were on the same division radio as the 3-4, which was up in Washington Heights. And the 3-4 was getting like a murder every three days back then. I, I was out of control. And on the radio, you couldn't even get in over the radio because the 3 4 precinct dominated the airspace. Everything was happening in the 3 4. Shots fired! You'd hear that screamed every night. Oh, we're chasing someone's, you know, you hear chases going on. Central, we just crashed, shots fired. And then you'd, oh, there's three people shot and are here. And you'd be like, oh my God, sounds like Vietnam, right? And this was going on uptown. And we felt like, wow, I'm glad I'm all the way down here, you know, in the, in the 2 4. But that was the nature of the city back then. Anyway, the natural progression was I did 
uh, back in uniform in the 2-4 precinct, and again, I got assigned to anti-crime. Now I was in heaven again. But I, now, instead of being a cop, I was the boss of the 2-4 anti-crime unit, which I loved. I loved teaching my, the cops that didn't have the background I had how to do what anti-crime does. And I loved doing that because, and the cops, I think, really appreciated learning it. And it's just like, I learned it from someone who was like a mentor to me when I first got the 2 0 anti crime. My sergeant had, I think, 18 or 19 years on the job at the time, and he had done 11 years in citywide anti crime. So he mentored me and taught me so many things that the same type of mentoring, I don't know if it exists today, but he was, he was fantastic, and I was able to learn a lot from him. And in turn, I taught the same things that he had taught me to the cops that worked for me in the 2 4. And from the, working the 2 4 anti crime, which I did for about three and a half years, they needed a robbery sergeant up in the detective squad. So I was uh, sort of chosen to do that. I took that, and that was when I first got into investigation. And now I, I had 12 detectives under me, and we investigated robberies. Back then it was called RIP, not Rest in Peace. It stood for um, Robbery Investigation Program. And any precinct that had 100 or more robberies per month, was designated back then to, to need a robbery unit. And the 2-4 back then got a lot more than 100 robberies a month. So we had a robbery unit, and I became the commanding officer of the 2-4 robbery unit, and I had 12 detectives under me. It was a lot different. At first, I really didn't like it because there wasn't as much action. Like I was wearing a suit and tie to work, which I still don't love wearing a suit and tie every day. And <clears throat> I had to supervise detectives. Now, detectives, as compared to cops, have huge egos. And detectives know everything, right? They know everything. Uh, yeah. And, um, I mean, I don't know everything, and they really don't either, but a lot of them think they do. So sometimes you bang heads with them, and um, the ones that are really, really competent, you look to them to help you because you're learning the trade too. You're learning the investigation trade because I didn't really know how to be an investigative boss back then. And it was a lot to learn, a lot of paperwork, a lot to learn about investigations, a lot to learn about supervising lineups, a lot to learn about dealing with the district attorney's office, so many different things. And as uh, besides your duties as the robbery supervisor, you sometimes had to supervise the division and supervise other squads. Uh, and anything major happened, you would have to respond to that squad and supervise that. So you may be the visiting boss and the detectives didn't know you and you didn't know them. So naturally you have conflict because they're like, oh, who's this new Jack? He's <laughs> going to tell me what to do. He doesn't even know this precinct. So you got in all kinds of conflict, but that's basically how you learned uh, how to be an investigative boss. So I stayed in the 2-4 robber unit from, um, I think it was 19... 95 to 1997, and then in 1997, I got transferred to uh, the 2-3 robber unit in Spanish Harlem. For me, it was like, and I don't want to put down the detectives in the 2-4 because there were some really good detectives there, and they, yeah, as a group, they were good guys. But when I went to the 2-3 robber unit, it was like going from the minors to the New York Yankees. These guys were, the, was, were probably one of the best robber units in the city. The detectives were almost, all of them were almost like superstars. And the 2 3 robber unit, these guys didn't even wear suits to work. They dressed like anti crime because they did a lot of work out on the street because they had a, the 2 3 was, was rocking. There was a lot of robberies. So when I got there, I was just like, wow, I'm just going to watch and learn because I had a lot to learn. I really did have a lot to learn from these guys. But yet I still somewhat knew what I was doing. I was in investigations for two years. So I had the 2-3 robber unit for about another year or two years, and then I moved over to 2-3 squad, and I started being a squad investigator, which is in the same building, same office. And I started investigating, you know, crimes like shootings, homicides, rapes, child abuse, things like that. And the 2-3 had a lot of um, domestic violence issues. Uh, they had a lot of child abuse issues. There was a lot of shootings. There was a lot of murders. Mm -hmm. So it was almost like a homicide squad, even though it wasn't a homicide squad. The detectives in the 2-3 squad to this day were some of the best detectives I ever worked with in my 27 years. And that includes the homicide squad. 
they had some of the best detectives there. And I always look upon my years there fondly. And um, the detectives there as just outstanding. And a lot of them never got rewarded for being as good as they were. Some of them never got great. They never, um, they never were, re were rewarded for the outstanding work they did. And I always said, how was this? There was a couple of them. I was just like, this guy had 26 years, and he retired as a third grade detective. And this guy was like a superstar. And he never got promoted. And I was like, and he was never bitter either. And I just was like, don't you feel bitter that you never got grade? Besides the prestige of getting grade for a detective, going from third grade to second is like $10,000. So it's more than just prestige. Show me the money, right? Going from uh, second grade to first is another ten. So you're talking twenty thousand dollar difference between a third grade and a first grade detective. So these guys silently went about their business doing unbelievable work, outstanding work in a very very violent precinct, and a, mo a lot of them never got rewarded for their work. Anyway, at some point I think it was 2002. Well, obviously in 2001, 9/11 happened. And then in 2002, I got transferred uh, to Manhattan North Homicide. And I, at that time, I had 17 years on a job. And I had really just intended to do 20. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. My last three years, I'll do, uh, I'll coast out making 400, 450 hours overtime a year, and I'll have a nice pension, and I'll leave at 20 years. But I liked the work so much that I stayed. And my wife always said to me, I thought we agreed you would leave at 20. I go, do you got a mouse in your pocket? Who's the we? Right? And I told her, I'm not leaving. And, you know, that's another story. But my wife was very good about it. I said, I'm not ready to leave. There's well, nothing no. for me to go to right now that interests me. And I wasn't interested in retiring when I did have 20 years. But what I did do, I did do actually do something smart. I went back to college in 2000 to get my master's degree, which was actually pretty damn hard to do while I was working in the 2-3 squad and then subsequently homicide. But, Bill, but if I didn't do that, I would have never been able to teach. Bill, before yes. you go, I want to act just real quick because you, you mentioned, and I want to touch on that real quick, um, you stated about you just weren't, weren't ready to retire, and I want to touch on that, but I have a uh, viewer question, and they want to know... Real quick, um, how would you? How many calls would you say you've responded to in your career? You know that that is so difficult to say. I, you know, oh, I, yeah, I would, yeah, it would have to be in in the thousands. You know, if it goes back twenty seven years. I mean, you know, interactions with the public, jobs, radio runs, self initiated. I mean, it, it's got to be no. thousands of interactions. You know, so it's I more can't, than just. A regular dispatch call, correct? Is that what you're right? Uh, some of self-initiated interactions. Okay. Okay. You know, it's not just uh, the radio directs you somewhere. When I was a boss on patrol, certain jobs I was mandated to respond to. Mm. Any jobs with a weapon, any DOAs, any family disputes, I was mandated to respond. So I didn't sell. Let the cops handle it. I'm not going to show up. So I, you know, probably, you know, I. You can't, it's hard to estimate. Hundreds, thousands, I don't know. But, you know, definitely thousands of interactions, whether they were jobs or even just going to tell someone that a relative was dead. All those jobs, yeah. you know, take their toll on you. Right. Tell, going, and, going to tell someone that a loved one is uh, has been killed, especially in a murder, is one of the hardest things a, an officer has to do. And in the Homicide Squad, we did that quite often. And it's, it's never a pleasant thing because um, after a while, you book the messenger becomes the enemy, you know, and people yeah. look at you like, you know, you're the Grim Reaper. You came here and gave me this horrible news. Get out of my house. So, okay. Right. And you understand that, but it's still not, I didn't do anything, you know. I'm telling you something horrible, but, you know, now, I, I understand that. I understand human nature. I probably would react the same way. You know, you're the bearer of bad news. Right. Okay, I got the news. Now get out of here. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's sort of the attitude they have. And now, and then, so you have, just listening to all this, 
you all of the constant constant um, whether it's adrenaline or um, action go 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 were you ready to retire did you have a problem with that and you touched a little bit on that you, you know I, I was could I maybe if I was in a different place when I had 20 years maybe I would have but I loved being in the homicide squad in fact three months after I got transferred into the homicide squad I got a call from someone who later became chief of detectives uh, that asked me if I wanted to go to the joint terrorist task force because I had had an application to go there and if I had stayed in the 2-3 squad I would absolutely have gone to the joint terrorist task force but I was in homicide and I, I turned them down and I said look I'm very happy where I am and people went out of their way to vouch for me to put me in this position and in all of Manhattan, there's only six sergeants in the homicide squad. The whole city, maybe there's 12 or 15. In the whole city, out of you know 5,000 sergeants, and I had one of those spots. I felt very honored and very privileged, and I loved the work. I really loved the work. So I turned it down. And Joint Terrorist Task Force is probably one of the best jobs on the police department because you work with the feds. You're investigating terrorism. You get a car, a take-home car. Basically, no one questions your overtime because the feds are paying for it. And you have the highest security clearance in the world. So when you leave the police department, you can get all kinds of federal jobs because you already have the security clearance. But I turned it down because I, I liked what I was doing so much. And I was where I wanted to be on the police department. And wow. I couldn't imagine doing anything that was more interesting and working with the best detectives probably on the police department and I learned, I always, you know, as a boss, I always felt that I could learn from the people I supervised. And if you think you can't, then you shouldn't be a boss, you mm -hmm. know, because a lot of these guys had experiences different than mine. Some of them had more experience than me. I had a detective in my team that had 40 years on the job, right? Most of the guys that worked with me had over 25 years on the job. Most of them had all worked up in Harlem. Most of them had worked uptown. And they had all been in detective squads for years. When other units from the police department worked with us, and I won't mention what units, I could see they were in awe of the homicide squad detectives. They would actually look at them like, in awe. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. And maybe they would deny that if they were asked that. But I could see how enamored they were and how amazed they were at the results they got from the work they did. So I, w I felt honored to be a boss in the North Homicide. And I had the A-Team, you know, and it's not like the movie, the A-Team, although someone actually drew a picture of us and <laughs> made us look like the people in the A-Team. Right. But they were superb detectives. And whenever there was any kind of major incident, it, could, it didn't even have to be a homicide, they would call the homicide squad, could be a kidnapping, could be anything, and they would have the best detectives in, in, the, whole, in the city working on the case. So that's where the chief would always go, get the homicide squad on this case. And, you know, we would walk in and people were like, oh, that's the homicide squad. And you got a certain level of respect that precinct detective squads didn't get because they knew these were the most experienced detectives and they'd been there and they'd done that. And it was, it was really, uh, it felt good to be part of that unit. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking um, all the, this is, we're going to, we're winding down a little bit. One of the things that is important um, to mention that no matter what, no matter how, and I, when I worked down at the jail, there were disagreements, people butted heads, but no matter what, if there was an issue or a problem, all, all LEOs, no matter who they were, came together, it was this family code, and, and that was that. It wasn't, whatever disagreements were um, there, disappeared. And I think that we saw that in general and as a nation um, 12 years ago um, as we all know that yesterday was the 12th anniversary uh, for 9-11 and you were a first responder correct yeah correct yeah, that's, that's right um, that that day changed the tragedy that happened changed everybody what was it like for you, um, when that happened, can you 
you know, you don't have to give too many details or whatever you're comfortable with. But I have I have absolutely no problem whatsoever talking about it. Okay. And for a lot of people, and for me included, it, it was a very sad day. But right. I was in the two three squad at the time, and we were ordered. We just saw like everyone else on TV, a plane hit the World Trade Center. Oh, it's a little plane. And then they when when some news reporter came up with the idea, slow down the videotape. And then they saw it was a jetliner. Everyone knew this was a terrorist attack. So we were ordered to put our uniforms on and because we were in plain clothes and, and go down downtown. And I remember I was with three detectives, uh, Detective William Hicks, Detective James Zarakix, and Detective Zedekiah Jennings. Billy Hicks is a, bl is a black guy from Brentwood, Long Island. Zedekiah Jennings is a black guy from the Virgin Islands. And Jimmy Zarakis is a Greek guy from Long Island. I was like, there's New York City, right? And we, res we responded down there. And I remember they closed the FDR drive. So we got down there in no time because there wasn't a single car on them except emergency responders. So on the way down there, um, I didn't realize this, but the first building had already fallen down when we were on East 102nd Street. I didn't realize that. We got in the car, we headed down the FDR drive, and Detective Hicks said to me, Sarge, let's park at South and Pike Street because if we pull up too close to the building, We'll never get out of there. You know, there'll be so many emergency vehicles there. I said, Billy, that's a good idea. And that little, like, decision that he put in my head my, may have saved our lives because we parked far enough away and had to walk toward it. As we walked towards uh, Ground Zero, the second building came down. And we had just walked past, uh, I think, Houston or Canal Street, and Canal Street as the second building came down. And I thought about it later on how Billy Hicks had said something to me like, let's not drive right down there. And, you know, that's experience, too, that he's made that suggestion. And, again, like I said, as a boss, I was open-minded and I listened to my detectives. Maybe that saved all our lives. And I just remember uh, we were ordered to go to a certain location and muster up because the police department smartly rostered everybody up so they could keep track of who was there and where they were. No one knew what it really, what was. Everyone, of course, thought there was going to be survivors, you know, and that there was doctors coming in from all over the world, police everywhere. I just remember the blank looks on the faces of the chiefs that were there. They had no idea what to do, no idea. And people always overuse the word surreal when they describe that day, but it really was. We couldn't even see. We were walking ground level. And the air was so thick with God knows what was in carcinogens, mm -hmm. uh, concrete that was airborne, right. you know, asbestos, all kinds of good stuff that I'm sure is in all of our lungs right now. Luckily, so far, all of us are healthy. Uh, and then we walked toward uh, our post. Mm -hmm. And I just remembered what, what was bizarre to me is that people calling in bomb threats over the air. Like, you think we're really concerned with a bomb threat now? The buildings just fell down, you know? But I was amazed that who's calling in bomb threats on right. this day, you know? Mm -hmm. And then we walked down there, and there was really, it was burning. The whole pile or the, uh, the what they later named Ground Zero was, was on fire from the jet fuel. Probably for like a week, the fire was uh, burning. And basically, we were just told to stand down, to stay where we were. And really, there wasn't much for us to do uh, other than be there, and in case they needed to deploy us somewhere. And then, of course, rumors were running rampant. Oh, this person's dead. That person's dead. The head of the police, you know, the whole top level of the police department was killed. And none of it was true. But all these rumors were, were running rampant. And there was also so many rumors about how many people uh, were dead, how many survivors there were, and it was the information all turned out to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. But we were down there also when Seven World Trade Center came down because we were a couple of blocks away, and all of a sudden we were told that the building was moving and to go back several blocks. Of course, you never listen. You want to get as close as you can. Oh, I want to see it fall. And then it started to fall. And it looked like one of those uh, 
Chinese movies when Godzilla comes and you see everyone running. That's what we looked like. We were running away from uh, Seven World Trade Center. And it was, the, whole, the whole experience was very surreal. Anyway, we worked till about, I guess we were down there from when the second building uh, came down. I knew we were there till about midnight. And then they let us go, but we had to be back at 4 a.m. And that lasted for about two to three weeks that we worked 12-hour tours. So we never got to go home. A lot of people were living at the precinct because they needed you to be there and they needed you to work 12-hour tours. Mm -hmm. And then some of my other duties with the World Trade Center, I worked um, a bunch of times at the morgue, which was um, some, I saw some of the worst things I've ever seen in my life as far as death goes. Right. The condition of the bodies they brought in, um, just body parts they brought in, you know, the sadness of seeing a cop brought in or a fireman brought in. Right. Um, the pathologists just putting their hands in goo on the table that you couldn't tell what this person was. And all of a sudden the pathologist, the pathologist would say, oh, it's a woman. And I'd be like, how did she know? And she felt the uterus. And I was just like, wow, this is really more than I really ever wanted to see. You know, I think I think it, it, this was just it was just something that's very sad for um, the United States and uh, you guys. Once again, I always say with each show, whether we do video or on uh, Criminal Lines Radio, just thank you guys for all that you do. Period in general, and 9/11 um, will forever be embedded um, in our uh, in the in the memory for United States. Unfortunately. Jim, is there anything you would like to add or say before we wind out? No, I think that uh, quite a few of the comments that we were hoping to get for this this episode to help you know crime writers understand more about what a a character or a story should do to represent you know real life. Yeah. I think Bill has come across with so many things that really help somebody think through their their writing and Absolutely. what they want to communicate and turn off the television version of what they've heard for so many hours and so many years mm -hmm. and say, but my audience needs to hear more of the real story. Right. Yeah, I have to agree. And I have to say, wow, Bill, this is just, it's been a pleasure. We get to work, to, we get to work again um, three other times this month. So I just want to say, once again, it was uh, wonderful to um, be here on the um, set with you and talk with you and just learn the realities um, from fiction. You have been so open and helpful. Um, well, Marguerite, it's almost like a uh, therapy session. You know? yeah. I don't know whether to send you guys a check now. For <laughs> I, I'm thinking of an amount. Can you guess? <laughs> yes. So. So, and Bill, you're awesome. So I will be pestering you um, later this week as we get ready for our show. Um, I think it's Saturday, right? Absolutely, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so we're, we're gonna I hope I don't run out of stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you better not. <laughs> uh, no, I won't. I won't. You'll have, have to go lot, back to work and create some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's over. I can tell you teaching stories now. You know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, for the next show upcoming, we're going to, I believe, we're on the record for discussing the investigation procedure. Um, Bill and I have brainstormed, and so we're really excited about this. And Jim has been awesome stepping in and helping out. So, Jim, thank you once again. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Hangouts great are, to meet you. <laughs> Hangouts are fun if you take them with, you know, the, what they're intended for, and that is live interaction between yeah. real people about things people care about. So That's this has right. been very, very good. <laughs> so I'm your host, Marguerite Ashton. Thank you for joining us here with the uh, Crime Writers Panel and Criminal Lines. It's been a wonderful uh, joining with our guest, um, Bill Cannon. Again, as I said, he's a professor at Monroe College. Send any emails or questions you have um, into the show, and I'll forward them to you. And he will answer them. He does reply. So we'll go ahead and end. And I just want to say thank you, Bill, and you have a wonderful evening. And you too, Marguerite. And Jim, great to meet you. Very good meeting you too, All Mr. Right. Cannon, Bill. <laughs> Take care, Bill. All right.